Here we are at the uh, AM transmitter site that I uh, take care of for work. And I was waiting for some other stuff and I figured I'd uh, give you a look at something really cool out here. You see, over there, that gray cabinet, that's the main transmitter, the Nautel XR6. That's on the air right now. But there's another transmitter out here that's much, much cooler. That would be this thing. This is an RCA BTA 5G AM transmitter installed in 1955 under the station's first owner and today being that this is the really awesome thing it is I'm going to give you a little tour of this thing this thing is 100% tube based other than you know, the occasional uh, retrofitted rectifiers and things a couple spots where there were selenium rectifiers and there are now silicon because the selenium ones are just woefully unreliable after all these years um, this here is the modulator cabinet. The audio comes in here and uh, it amplifies the living heck out of it, <laughs> I suppose you could say. So we've got actually these uh, these two empty tube sockets uh, for those interested or would have been used if this was the 10 kilowatt version, the BTA 10G, but this is not. This is the 5 kilowatt version, so those are not used. Um, I gotta remember exactly what order the audio stages go in. I know these two, these are 807s here. Starts here. And then of the other two pairs, it's got two more amps, two more amplification stages, and then you have the main modulator tubes. These RCA 5762s down here. These ones are actually rebuilt by a company called Econco. Those are more recent. Um, inside here, I should note, this is the modulator arc gap. And if you overmodulate this thing enough, you'll actually get a spark fly across there. And I'll tell you, when that happens, be prepared to jump. Because <laughs> it is rather loud, I'll put it that way. <laughs> you got some meters along the inside here. Um, so those are, those are a little bit of a pain to read because this door actually has to be closed for the transmitter to turn on. So that's why, or one reason why there is actually in-cabinet lighting in here, which I, originally it would have used uh, what were called Lumaline fixtures, which uh, are now very much on obtainium. So I actually put in a standard Edison-based fixture in each of these cabinets in order to uh, fix that. Um, a couple of these meters are not used because, once again, you got the two empty sockets. So those would have been used for those. And there's one over here that I noted is sticky. As in it, uh, it'll go up but not come down sometimes. <laughs> You'll shut the thing down and it'll still be reading something. It's like, what in the heck is that about? So yeah, there's that. And then over here in the next cabinet over, we have the power amplifier stage, which does the uh, final amplification of the uh, RF signal. This is driven by these two 5762s here, which these ones are the genuine RCA articles because the uh, Econco rebuilds that were in here actually appear to have overheated at some point and looked a little sketchy. So we put some spares that we had floating around in here. As you can see, we got more cabin in cabinet uh, meters here. These are for the uh, cathode current on these tubes. Which again, you got to look through the uh, the windows. See all these doors, all these sliding doors have windows, and you got to kind of turn in, turn on the light and look through the windows to read those while the thing is operating. Over here, we've got the driver stage, which is where the actual RF signal itself is generated. We've got two different oscillator decks with two separate crystal units in them. And this would have been used at the time, that would have been used for the Conelrad system, which would have required that in an emergency a station would have been able to move on to another frequency, either 640 or 1240. This transmitter is not equipped with that at the moment. Um, it just has two of the same crystal installed, so they're just redundant which I believe has had to, the redundancy has had to be used at one point because one of these was actually dead for a while um, but I think we have since gotten it to work I believe it had a bad tube in it and I think one of the crystal units we found has a bad heater so and I should note that yes these crystal units are old enough to need heaters and that's actually why these lights up here cycle on and off there's a little thermostat inside each of those red boxes and there's a, along with a little heating element and when one of them turns on, it lights the appropriate Crystal Heater 1 or Crystal Heater 2 light. So, and of course, this being as old as it is, those indicator lamps are all incandescent. In the bottom of this cabinet, 
we have four RCA 8008s, or these are actually um, these are actually national power tube units. They're aftermarket, I suppose. Um, but these are actually mercury vapor rectifier tubes, and these are part of the um, they call it the low voltage power supply, as if 1600 volts or so is low voltage. <laughs> but this provides the plate voltage to many of the smaller tubes in the transmitter. Not to the not to the 5762s. Those are driven by the high voltage 5 kilovolt supply. <laughs> More on that in a bit. So these tubes glow a brilliant blue when they're in operation. And so I'll have to show you that a little later. Now up here we've got the main driver tube. This is the an RCA 833A and uh, this this glows br this also glows brilliantly, but more of a uh, light bulb type tungsten color. And last but not least, we have the rectifier and control cabinet. Up inside here, behind this window, there are four RCA, or again in this case, National uh, type 5563 Thyrotron tubes. These are also mercury vapor rectifiers, although these ones also have the ability to be shut down by a sufficient bias voltage which this transmitter uses to do all kinds of clever things, as I'll describe in more detail a little later. Now, the other thing mercury vapor rectifier tubes are known for is for when they start to die, they will begin to throw what are called arc backs. And basically, as, as I understand it, an arc actually forms in the tube and current will actually flow the opposite direction of the way it's supposed to. This can very easily burn the heck out of a transformer or some such thing because it creates an absolutely amazing amount of current when that happens. So what this transmitter has is it actually has an arc back detection circuit on each of these tubes that allows it to detect when an arc back is occurring and shut the power supply down. In doing so, it will light, assuming these actually work, which I've never actually seen them light up, it will actually light one of these lights to indicate which tube was the offending one. We also have, I should note, these lights here will normally glow dimly, but they are designed to detect if the control circuitry is being shorted by something, and if that happens, one of the two of them will turn bright. So it's a little clever thing to do so to avoid causing arcs and sparks and popping breakers and things. <laughs> Down here, we've got the main circuit breaker panel for the transmitter. We've got the five individual breakers up here the big breaker for the high voltage plate supply here, and the bigger breaker, actually it's not the bigger breaker, it's, <laughs> these are actually both 100 amp three pole breakers. This one is the main line breaker for the whole transmitter. There is also a breaker down in the panel in the basement that this transmitter is connected to. Now of course, wouldn't you know, you can't really see it on camera, but back in here, this is the back of the, of the uh, driver cabinet, and just the back of all these just has more componentry and various things. You'll see, if you can actually see this on camera, you'll see that this this transmitter predates printed circuit boards. <laughs> so everything in here is uh, directly, wi discreetly wired to where it needs to go. And um, yeah, you don't see anything quite like that anymore now, do you? <laughs> Now, down in the bottom of this cabinet, something that I think some of you might find interesting. This is the main blower that cools the transmitter. Let me see if I can get my flashlight out so you can actually see this. Um, it's driven by this big three-phase motor down here. And that belt actually still looks surprisingly good. <laughs> which turns that wheel, which turns this big honking thing that looks like a furnace fan back here. In fact, if you look up here, the camera will actually focus on it. It was manufactured by none other than Train. <laughs> so yeah, that has one heck of a blower in it. Now in the back of this cabinet, there's up here, there's better look at those Thyrotron tubes from before. In the back of this cabinet is the controller for the high voltage power supply. This thing here, known as the Thyrotron control board, is <laughs> A remarkably complicated circuit for something that is just supposed to shut power down in the event of an overload in that plate circuit. This does a few other clever things, though. 
This first off can automatically recycle the power on and off up to a certain uh, extent. So if there's just a real fleeting overload, it can actually turn itself back on once it passes. The other thing this does is it's intended to operate faster than a circuit breaker or relay can. And it does this by virtue of this tube right here. That's a little RCA 2D21, which is also a thyrotron tube, actually, I do believe. And what that does is it's basically kind of an in instantaneous switch of sorts. And when an overload occurs, that starts conducting and then that will apply a bias voltage to the grids of these tubes to shut them down within half a cycle of the AC line. So yeah, that's pretty darn quick now, isn't it? <laughs> and the idea is that it can do that faster than the breaker on the front can respond. I should also note that this circuit is incredibly temperamental. <laughs> As you can see, we've actually replaced a number of capacitors. On, actually, we've replaced all the capacitors on this board because they were getting a little sketchy. Also replace several selenium rectifiers with silicon diodes. And, um, and to be honest, we're still not really sure that it operates right. As we were looking around the site, we actually found some letters between the uh, first owner of the station and RCA and, uh, and the FCC, I believe, for various reasons, due to all kinds of faults that occurred because this circuit didn't work as it should have. So yeah, that, that's all kinds of fun. Now over here I should point out, this here, I do believe, is the low voltage plate transformer, or well, again, low voltage being like 1600 volts or so. <laughs> uh, that, this generates that voltage from the incoming AC line, which in our case is 208 volts AC. And then over here, in this box, is the high voltage plate transformer. <laughs> That generates the 5 kilovolt supply. And so it takes three phase 208 volts in and puts out, actually it's a, uh, a Scott T transformer and it's wired, rather than putting out two sets of two phase, it's actually wired to put, it's actually used as a single four phase supply at 5 kilovolts. Now up here, behind there, there are three little reactor coils. And what those are supposed to do is those are supposed to limit the current in the event of a fault. And we actually had a long-running issue where this transmitter was popping breakers on startup. And it turned out what had happened was someone had jumpered those out. And we're not really sure why, but someone did. And the, by virtue of not having those in line, the inrush current of starting the transmitter up was actually enough to pop the 100 amp breaker in the basement. So yeah, that's how much power is involved here. We better close this up. <laughs> and I should also mention that this thing here, which lives inside cabinet four, this is a grounding stick, or as some people call it the Jesus stick. And what this does is this is used, this is a safety feature that you use before you work on this. That you go touch this to anything that would be would have been energized at high voltage when the transmitter was on to make sure that there are no capacitors charged in that circuit. And um, let me tell you, seeing the flash that comes out from discharging some of these capacitors is, once again, be prepared to jump. <laughs> Luckily, nothing in here is charged right now, so I can't demonstrate that. Now, up here along the top, you got your various indicator lights and meters to tell you what the transmitter is doing at any given time. And this meter is actually missing for some reason. I'm not sure why. You got more of them over here. And then down the middle, we've got a series of additional overload lamps. These are supposed to tell you where an overload is taking or has taken place. You've got your power adjustment dial, which this actually serves to vary the voltage of the high voltage plate supply. And the way this works is, this is the other trick that RCA did with the uh, Thyrotron tubes, is there's actually a pulse generator in here. It generates a, um, a series of a pulse train, basically. To, that's intended to fire the thyrotron tubes in, the, in cabinet four. And what this does is this varies the phase relationship of those pulses to the incoming AC line. And the idea is that by shifting this, you can vary where the pulse hits and at what point on the AC waveform that it starts conducting 
so that you can kind of vary the voltage up and down. And if you think, if you think that sounds like how modern solid state dimmers work, well, you would be absolutely right. On the sides here, we've got tuning controls. These are used to tune, this one tunes the power amplifier, and this one tunes the driver. And those are used in initial setup, and uh, probably after tube change, too. Down here, we got our control switches, which will actually start kind of from the bottom here. This is the main, the main on-off switch of sorts. This turns on the filaments and the blower. And then up here, you got a high-low power switch, which actually, we don't have that option installed in this transmitter, so this doesn't actually do anything. If we were a station that needed to drop power at night, rather than just go to a directional, um, a directional transmission pattern, this would be this would actually serve to drop the power from five kilowatts down to one kilowatt. Over here is a switch that switches between the two oscillators in the other cabinet. This just turns on the lights that I mentioned earlier. And then this switch is the real fun one. This turns on the plate supplies. It energizes a series of contactors that will serve to turn on the low and high voltage plate supplies when the uh, time comes, because they can't just be turned on immediately. The transmitter actually needs to be allowed to warm up for a little while with just the filaments on before you can turn this on. Theoretically, there is actually a timer in here that's supposed to allow you to turn this on prematurely and then have it turn the plates on when the time comes, but I have never actually tried that. <laughs> and I don't really want to risk it, so I usually just wait and turn this on myself. And down here, we've got the overload reset buttons. Low voltage, high voltage, and then this is supposed to test, I forget which overload it is, but I've never actually gotten, I've never actually gotten this to work. Um, I believe this was supposed to test, there's a remote over, there's a provision in here for a remote overload that's supposed to be triggered by something out at the antenna, but that was never installed as the, um, the phasing and coupling system is not an RCA, it's actually by gates, so this, I think, is not hooked up. This resets all the other random overload lamps, like the cluster of six up top. So with a nice old transmitter like this, we can't just let it sit here. No, we definitely can't do that. So what do we have to do? We're going to start it up. See our line voltage is now reading on there. And now we can come over, turn that on. Now the blower, the uh, air ducts have come up to pressure and the filaments are switched on. You can see that tube glowing brilliantly in there. And now we just kind of wait for things to warm up. You can see those two in there. Those look really cool. And in there. And so we'll give this thing a little while to warm up. And then we're going to try and start it. But we're not actually going to put it on the air today. We got up in that box, way up there on top of the phaser cabinet, that's a dummy load. And so what that does, is that's just, it's basically a giant resistor. And it just takes all the RF out of the transmitter and dissipates it to heat. And that's just used to test a uh, transmitter that is not on the air. So you can run it at full power, in, our, in this case, that is a full power load. Um, so you can run it and make sure it works and all that fun stuff. In the case of tube transmitters, you want to exercise them from time to time into a load or whatever just to uh, keep all the crap out of them. While we're waiting here, I figured I'd uh, mention this is, in fact, actually our backup transmitter here at this facility. If the other one goes, the one in the other room goes dead, this is what we get to go on the air with. Because this thing over here, this is the previous main transmitter a Harris MW5A that was installed around 1980 or so, I believe by the second owner. This thing, I don't know the story behind it, but I seem to have heard, I seem to recall hearing at least, that this thing was kind of a lemon. <laughs> and I'm not entirely sure what happened to it in its final days, but for whatever reason it was decided, probably that it wasn't reliable enough to be a backup, and that this thing should remain in that, uh, <laughs> in that role. I also hear that it is, da that it is um, damn near impossible to find parts for that Harris transmitter. Whereas, being that this RCA actually uses largely off-the-shelf parts, that it's actually easier to find parts for this thing than it is to find parts for that. So there's that too. Okay, 
I think it has now been long enough. Time to figure out the age-old question. Will it start? And sure enough, it did. <laughs> We've got voltage. Our 1600 volt supply is on. We've got only a little glow out of those tubes right now. We should have a nice glow out of these ones. Indeed, we do. So, as photonic induction would say, let's crank it right up. Can't say it the way he does, though. So. <laughs> There's our high voltage supply. And we're looking for about 4,700 volts. So I can actually do this. It's probably going to be wildly unstable on camera. But there we go. Full power into that load. And now we should have a nice, nice bright glow out of these. Indeed we do. So there's just one thing left to do. And that's to apply some modulation. We've got our modulation monitor right here. And we're going to take a patch cable from up here. This is still done this way. we got to make a permanent connection for this. But this can go right to there. It's actually peaking a little bit. I should probably knock that down a little bit. Our levels are probably a little higher than they ought to be. But we now have modulation into the transmitter. And what's really awesome about this is that's not a speaker you're hearing this on. You're actually hearing the audio off the internal components of the transmitter, particularly down inside here. There's a big transformer that likes to vibrate with the modulation. Well, you also hear it inside the power amplifier cabinet too, it sounds like. Modulator plate current's looking pretty good. Especially for something that's totally not designed to be running off a modern uh, Optimod audio processor. <laughs> I just love how you can see the glow of the rectifier tubes pulse with the modulation. That is just wildly awesome. Of course, you're not really supposed to look into these because I believe they put out UV rays in addition to visible light. But, um, we all know every broadcast engineer who deals with these always looks into them. <laughs> Listen to that transformer hum. <laughs> Obviously I can't open that box because doing so would be incredibly dangerous. Actually I'm surprised that box isn't interlocked. But it's funny, you can actually hear the hum change slightly as the modulation hits. I still can't believe that hour meter actually works. <laughs> Most other transmitters we have that have those, they've long since broken. And none of those are nearly as old as this one. But yeah, needless to say, this thing's a little bit of a celebrity among local broadcast engineering circles. But yeah, so here it is, in all of its glory, running at full power. Let this thing run for a while and then uh, we'll shut her down. Now of course, with this transmitter we can't push it to the uh, full plus 125% modulation that you're allowed on AM nowadays because it was never designed for that. It was designed back at the plus or minus 100% days. So, uh, <laughs> and as I implied earlier, I did find that out the hard way one time <laughs> when I tripped the aforementioned modulator arc gap while trying to push it a little harder than I should have. <laughs> you can see we're really hitting the uh, edge on the negative side though. You got the peak flasher hitting every once in a while. So we really can't push the, uh, can't really push it up much further without causing a problem. Okay, it's been a little bit now. I've had it run for a little while. I think it's been a good test. It's time to shut the thing down. So first what we're going to do, I've already removed modulation. I'm going to back the power down. As 
slowly. <laughs> Don't want to cause problems here. Slowly back it back down to zero, or as close to zero as it'll go. It doesn't like to go all the way down to zero for whatever reason. And then we hit the plate switch off, and then we just let the blower run for a little bit to cool everything down. Well, now that it's had some time to cool down, I think it's time to say good night, RCA.